Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hey, everyone, and welcome to episode 348 of the Mom Hour. I am Megan Francis here with Sarah Powers. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Megan. How are you? I'm great because it's one of our favorite times of the year. It's listener questions time. I'm excited about this. Really excited. We have some really good questions today. We do. And just as a reminder, um, we do ask for these throughout the year. Um, periodically, we will dive in and answer several in one episode because, you know, while we do a lot of episodes, we can't get to every single topic that moms are thinking about. And so this gives us a chance to really dive in and give some personal experience around things that maybe you're going through um, that we haven't covered recently. Yeah, that's so true. And I think um, I know we have a lot of new listeners who've been reaching out to say hello. And I think if you are a relatively new listener, I think these are one of my favorite types of episodes to, I guess, give everybody a little peek inside our we're just two moms (laughs) with a bit of experience. Um, But we end up telling some stories and maybe covering topics we wouldn't devote an entire episode to. But when asked, we usually have some thoughts and advice. Um, We also love when we get to hear your voices. So I'm really excited both this week and next week. We have several voicemails. Um, I also understand. I know I've had people write to us and be like, I am not leaving a voicemail. I hate the sound of my voice. I sound awkward. It's just not my medium. So I totally get that. And we we still take uh, questions that come in by email as well. But there's something because this is a podcast medium. There's something so nice about hearing your voices when you uh, leave us your question. So I'm excited that we have some of those today. Yeah. And hot tip. Everybody hates their voice. So oh, yeah. <laughs> including Sarah and I often we I don't love listening to my recorded voice either. So, um, yeah, we really appreciate hearing from you either way. But it is a little it's just a little extra special when it's a voicemail. Yeah. OK, Megan, one of the things I love about our partner, the Essential Calendar, is you don't have to wait all year to get that fresh new calendar feeling. Their calendars are poster sized and they display a whole season at a time. So just when you're feeling like you need a fresh outlook, pop, you get to swap one out. I've got winter 2023 up right now, and it takes us up to spring break in March. Yeah, this is so helpful for my brain, Sarah. You know, I have kids who live in different cities now, not to mention having their own plans and lives, plus a partner with his own kids, a new business venture. It's a lot. This year, I'm doing more of that high level long term planning than I have in a while. And I find it so helpful to have the easy visual that the essential calendar provides. And it looks so pretty on my wall, too. What's brilliant about the essential calendar to me is that it's not really about that 2 p.m. dentist appointment or remembering to bring snacks to the soccer game. We've all got our little systems for that stuff. This is a way to visualize a season of your life at a time and make sure that the plans you're making weeks out are helping you live the life you want with your family. For me, it's almost about putting less on the calendar and protecting time for what's most important. Check out everything The Essential Calendar has for 2023 at theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour. When you use that link, you'll get 10% off your purchase and will earn a small commission at no additional cost to you. That's 10% off at theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour. Okay, so first we're hearing from Allison from the Boston area. And I love this question because I don't think we've ever had a question quite like this about having a new nanny that's not quite as fun Mm -hmm. as the old nanny um, and how her kids are dealing with that. So um, let's jump in. Hey, Megan and Sarah, it's Allison from the Boston area. Um, We recently had a nanny for about six months that was young and fun, a lot more fun than myself or my husband and she used to take the kids out and about every day to do random things run errands go to petco to look at the fish go to stop and shop to look at the bakery just like random stuff and my sons who are three and five got really used to it and now every night before bed my five-year-old asks me what fun things are we going to do tomorrow And I always try to tell him, we don't have to do something fun every single day. But they got into this habit of going out and doing something every day. And now with our newer nanny, who doesn't do that, and it's fine that she doesn't, um, I don't know how to explain to the kids that, like, you don't have to do fun things every day. And life isn't always fun. And sometimes it's just a regular old day. Any tips? Thanks. 
Okay. Well, first of all, thank you, Allison. Allison's a longtime friend of the podcast and has sent us questions before. Um, yeah, you're right, Megan. This is like a specific situation, but what I'm hearing at the heart of it is that very common thing where kids get almost like addicted to the next hit of fun. And I think, I think Allison's boys are five and three, I think, but I feel like this really ramps up in like the seven, eight range. There's Mm. something where like kids get a little older, a little wiser And like they know the difference between a day spent at home with their Legos and going to going somewhere fun, going to get ice cream, going to the park. Um, And they start to have opinions, which is great because that is what developmentally that is what kids are supposed to do. Figure out what they like and um, all of that is good. So I think the thing that jumped out to me is less about the first nanny being really into outings and the second nanny not. And more that there's likely, especially a five-year-old um, who maybe feels a little bit like he doesn't know what to expect with each day, um, m- maybe even possibly feels a little bit anxious about a new caregiver or a new routine. And so the fun, of course, every kid wants a day full of fun. But I think kids also really like to kind of know what to expect. And almost like it's almost like they want to protect their own potential disappointment if there isn't fun on the calendar. So the first thing I thought of when I heard Allison talk is this kid might benefit from uh, a child sized version of like a quick little meeting about the week up ahead or the day up ahead, something like a whiteboard or a piece of paper or a clipboard where he can actually feel like he knows he knows what's on the schedule, knows what to expect, and maybe even gets to contribute some of his own ideas for fun So I might, if this were my kid, I might sit down with this kid and help him make a list of all the things that feel really fun to do out in the world and let him go crazy like Disneyland or, you know, going on an airplane or going to like the, the, the petting zoo, like all the fun things and then help walk that back toward like, also it's fun to go walk around the block and look for rocks in the park and, you know, kind of like makes, make a list of some things that are achievably fun and also some things that are fun at home and really help him be a part of that brainstorming process so that when it comes time to make a plan for the day or to talk about what's coming up this week, um, we're gently reframing that it's not so binary fun and not fun. What are we, what have you got? What have you done for me lately? Like what's on the schedule today (laughs) that's going to make my life amazing, but maybe almost help him feel like he has a little bit more controls the, not the word I'm looking for, but a little more agency in the process. And that, that there is a spectrum of fun and that plenty that the new nanny is able to do with them is actually quite fun for him. I think there's this black and white thinking for a five-year-old, especially that like, if it's not X, then it is the opposite, if that makes sense. Well, and, and this definitely isn't limited to a nanny situation. I mean, this, these like fluctuations between being like the fun mom and the not so fun mom Uh um, happen in our households too, right? Like for lots of reasons, um, you know, maybe your workload increases and, or you have a little sibling at home or you've been sick or whatever. So definitely all the advice you just gave is great and could apply, um, in a lot of situations. I think one thing I would add that just popped out at me while Allison was talking, and I I wasn't really clear on how she feels about like the nanny's role and whether, um, whether it was really helpful for her when she had the other nanny to have her kids kind of get worn out a little bit, or maybe to have some of that desire to do fun things absorbed by the person she's paying to help. So Mm -hmm. I guess I would just say that I also think it's okay not to expect two different nannies to be, uh, you know, like complete copies of each other. Everyone has different strengths and this new nanny I'm sure has like a completely different set of strengths, but I don't think it's wrong either for her to say, you know, like it would just be great for you to plan something, mm-hmm. maybe not every single day, but like some kind of outing a couple days a week or something so that like I'm getting what I need out of the situation, which is a couple of worn out little boys. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in her situation, when I had three and five year old kids, if I had hired a nanny, that might've been really what I needed out of mm-hmm. that is like, not just someone to watch them, but someone to kind of like take care of some of these things. So I don't have to. Yeah. Like create novelty for them. I think that is really hard as a parent and something that's really helpful. Um, if you are, you know, bringing in a new caregiver is that they create novelty and whether that's like with a ton of outings, like you said, but that, that is a huge part of the service in addition to many other things that they're providing. So yeah. And I don't want to make assumptions about the relationship with the new nanny or there's her skills or, you know, their skills or whatever, but 
just, just something to keep in mind. Like if Allison, if you're feeling kind of like, Oh, I do kind of wish they were getting out a little bit more. I think it's okay to make that ask. So I think, I think so too. And I think that's a really good point. Um, I just want to add to finally that I think there can be this reflexive thing where we don't want spoiled kids. And when, Mm -hmm. when kids start to assert their opinions about what they want to eat and where they want to go. And last time we got two scoops of ice cream and this time you're only letting us get one. I can be, we're like sucking up buttercup. (laughs) Yeah. Like I can be very um, activated by that kind of behavior Mm -hmm. because I like, I, I want to go into like, do you know how lucky you are? Like, We are, you know, and so I just want to, this is like advice I'm constantly giving myself, remind Allison that um, you are likely doing a great job at raising boys who will grow up to have perspective on like what, what it means to have a fun day and that they will be grateful. And that takes a really, really long time. And I think it's really normal for this age kid to have that, like, what have you done for me lately? Like, where's my fun today, mom? You haven't done anything wrong. A lot of times I do think it's about that deeper need for what's on my schedule for the day. I don't yeah. I don't know what to expect. And if I had my choice, I would eat only dessert, but I don't have a choice. So at least show me the meal plan It's kind of like where I'm circling around. Yeah. All right. Well, Allison, good luck. And thanks again for sending in that question. Um, Megan, let's move on. I'm going to read a bit of an email that came in from Allie. So we had Allison and now Allie. Um, And part of Allie's question goes right to you, Megan. So I'll read that part first. She actually sent us two questions and I think we've got time. So we'll take them both, but I'm going to read the first part first. Sure. Okay. Allie says, I just want to start off by saying that I'm a 20 year old mama to a two year old little boy. I've been listening to your podcast since I first found out I was pregnant. I had a friend recommend it to me. You guys have taught me so much about the normals in parenthood and I look forward to listening every week. So here's my question. With being a young mom, I feel like I don't get taken as seriously as older moms. I'm mainly referring to pediatric appointments. My concerns seem to be pushed off or looked at like I'm kind of silly. So I was wondering, Megan, did you ever experience this when you were a new mom at a younger age? Oh, my gosh. Yes. Allie, starting from the time I was pregnant, really, I mean, I I ended up ditching the OBGYN that I was seeing at like 34 weeks pregnant and switching to a different um, practice because I felt like I was so dismissed and I was very well read. I was like really, really informed more yeah. than a lot of older moms I knew. And when I brought things up was very much just kind of brushed off. Um, so yes. And I would say that that continued through my early twenties kind of, you know, maybe I just stopped noticing it as much because by the time I was like 25 and had three kids or maybe I was 26 when Will was born, but you know what I mean? I was, I was in my mid to late twenties and had, um, three kids. And then I felt like an old pro. So like I think I was taken more seriously, even though I still had a baby face, Mm -hmm. Um, but definitely in those early years and, and not just by medical professionals, but by moms at moms group, things like that. Like, I just feel like it took me a lot longer to prove my stripes, I guess. Um, And the good news is it didn't really hurt anything in the end. I was usually still able to advocate for myself. It just, everything just felt like it was a little more work. Mm -hmm. And like, I constantly was like, kind of had a little chip on my shoulder trying to prove that I wasn't, you know, a total newbie or like I knew what I was doing. And, um, it does go away. And I think that as your kids get older, it goes away as much as, as you get older, it goes away. And I I'm thinking probably a lot of moms who are in the youngish age range. So not even as young as Allie, you are, or as young as I was, but like, you know, anyone like 30 and under with a newborn or, you know, two year old down is probably going to sometimes feel like they're being a little bit dismissed. So it's very normal. Did you find that, like you said, you switched providers with your pregnancy. Did you find that there were a few bright spots, like someone who would occasionally take you more seriously and that actually switching, sometimes switching providers helped or was it, did it more feel like it was just stripes you had to earn across the board? Um, I think that switching providers did help to some degree, keeping in mind that there are things you can't control in a medical environment. Um, Like you can go out of your way to find, say, like a nurse midwife who, you know, is going to take your concerns more seriously and, you know, and talk to you for longer or like a a nurse practitioner. They, you know, typically have a little bit of a reputation for spending more time with you, which may mean that you'll get, I don't know, just more time for someone to hear you and understand 
that you know things, but you still have to deal with the same front desk person. When you come in, you're still going to, when you're in the hospital, having your baby, you're still going to have rotating nursing staff and you can't really control that. Right. So, yeah. So I think some of it, like switching providers in some cases when it was important, I felt like it was, if it was important enough, I would do that. Um, Sometimes it really wasn't, but I really do feel like my kids getting older and me getting more confident made it like, it just bounced off. I didn't care anymore. Like Mm -hmm. I knew what I knew and I didn't care if someone else saw that I knew I didn't Mm -hmm. have anything, I didn't have as much to prove, um, which I actually think weirdly made me more able to find providers who saw me that way as confident and knowledgeable, whether I would have had that same experience with that same provider at a different age. I don't know, you know, Mm -hmm. so it's hard to say. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. It makes absolute sense and hopefully helpful to Allie. Um, yeah. Well, I want to get to Allie's second question, totally unrelated to young motherhood. Um, I'll read it and then I definitely uh, have an answer that came to mind and I'm sure you will too, Megan. Allie says, did your kids ever have something kind of odd that they were obsessed with? My son, and again, I think her son is two, constantly wants to have his tennis shoes on. He doesn't want them off for bath, bed, or just lounging around. It seems like maybe he wants to always be on the go. It's usually a pretty big tantrum when his dad or I decide it's take time to take them off for the day. So I'm just smiling because this is like so developmentally appropriate for a two-year-old. And yes, I have not only had kids get attached to kind of odd things, but also like, but in my friend group and like peer circles, I just can think of so many funny anecdotes. I remember somebody's kid attached to a remote control, like a, like a TV remote, and would carry it around and want to take a nap with it. Like the stories are endless. So if it's about normalizing, I feel like this is so normal. I do think two-year-olds are um, figuring out like that they have opinions about things. And sometimes it's like having, having a say, having control over something, not being, having too much change all at once and wanting to like cling to the thing that can be the same. Sometimes it's like a personality or a style preference. We had one little girl in our play group who had to wear, she called them tutus, but I think she could be convinced that any, anything with like a ruched skirt, even if it was like a tunic that had that little ruffle at the bottom, that would count. But like, she would cry when she got in the bath because she didn't have a tutu on. And she was so (laughs) little that it was less about how she looked. And it was more like what this probably feels like with sneakers and a two-year-old that it's like, this is a part of me. Like you can't, you know, you can't take away this, this essential part of me. So the two that came up that I remember is that, um, remember when Apple devices, Megan used to come with a sticker? Like if you got an iPhone, yeah. it came with that kind of translucent gray Apple sticker. And as far as I knew, you really only got them if you bought a new iPod or a, I, I mean, it was, they weren't like, yeah, I don't think you, you couldn't get them anywhere no, else. I don't think, but no. somehow we ended up, I think like a few of them had been put in a drawer, maybe like two sheets of two had been put in a desk drawer and read got a hold of him. He was probably two and a half. And we put one on his shirt and just like, here, take an Apple sticker. Well, he some for some reason felt like he had to have an Apple sticker, that Apple sticker or one exactly like it on every shirt. We're like, dude, we can't just go out and buy more like iPhones. Like, so we would like, we would try to wash it. And like one of the shirts, like actually it washed and kind of stayed on. I remember trying to move it from one shirt to the other. And we maybe had three or four total Apple stickers. And we were like scrambling, trying to keep his shirt you know, with an Apple sticker. Um, and then for a while, when he was a little older, he also had to wear, uh, if his shirt had an animal on it, it had to be a carnivore. That was a little older. That's like a little bit more of like a three-year-old thing. Oh no, that is great. Yeah. It had to be a meat eater. I love that. Yeah. Preferably a dino (laughs) meat eater, but I think tigers and lions, like mammal meat eaters were okay, but not, a not a plant eater. I, I definitely remember my kids having really specific ideas about, well, and you know, we've talked about boy fashion and when my boys were little, it was worse than it is now where there was very limited options besides balls and bears and baseball bats and trucks and things like that on little boys clothing. And, um, and I can't remember which kid I want to say it was Jacob had really specific ideas about like what could be on a shirt, which was very mm-hmm. limiting and it had nothing, it had nothing to do with like the, um, actually, no, it was Isaac. It had nothing to do with like the texture. It didn't have anything to do. It wasn't a sensory thing. It was truly like he did not want to wear to present to the world. Uh-huh. Um, I believe it was, he didn't want any balls on his shirt, oh, okay. which is so interesting. Cause he played ball. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't get it. It just, it was not a fashion choice he wanted. 
Um, at Christmas, it was kind of fun. The kids were all sitting around talking about each other's idiosyncrasies uh-huh. and when they were little. And some of the things I had forgotten, some of the things there, they were too young to have remembered. So at one point they must've been family lore. Mm-hmm. Um, like Jacob used to strip completely naked when he went to the bathroom, things like that. But he was so little, his younger siblings wouldn't have ever known that. So they must have heard about it from him or something mm-hmm. else. And it like became part of the family lore. So yes, all like not all kids, but most kids have some odd thing they do. Another one I remember is, um, I believe again, it was Isaac who was a collector. He just would fill his pockets with mm-hmm. the most random junk. And it was almost like the filling of the pockets was the compulsion. Just like yeah. it could be anything, little things you'd find here and there. And I'd always have to remember to empty them out because they'd go in the wash and there rocks would just be like washer. Yeah. rocks and like just beads and coins and little car, just anything, anything yeah. he found that looked like a treasure. Yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> I love it. Well, I think for us, it feels nostalgic and sweet. And Allie, just letting you know, feels very normal to hear about it from you. And also, I think I would just recommend you pick your battles as with anything with kids of all ages and especially two year olds. Um, If for some reason the shoes have to come off like a bathing experience, you know, then that's that's one thing. If there are times when it's not worth picking that battle and it seems weird to have a kid sleep in his shoes, I I, that's no judgment here. I mean, I, I could see myself saying yes to sneakers on for 98% of a two-year-old's life and like <laughs> right. a couple of mandatory shoe they're removal just, sessions. They're just and that's bathed it. with their feet yeah. up in the air. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Like honestly, like it'd be really, and sometimes that's what toddler parenting is, is like drilling down into like, wow, I have to really reframe what is absolutely essential because I'm going to yep. have to let a lot go. Um, I would say the yep. same about teenagers, actually. So <laughs> Hugh, is- when I dropped Jacob and Isaac off at daycare in their uh, Spider-Man and Batman costumes and uh-huh. got looked at like I was crazy. I was like, look, I mean, yeah. I had to get out the door today. OK, yep. and they don't want to take them off. And what am I going to do? So yeah. who cares? They're like basically pajamas. I know. Totally. Yeah. Um, well, before we leave Allie, I just have to read this last part of her email because she included a great idea for a future episode or maybe a more than mom. But she said it would be really fun if we did something like who's more likely to and polled our audience, meaning is Megan or Sarah more likely to dye their hair a crazy color, for example. So I don't think we've ever done anything like that. We've definitely let our listeners ask us anything. And we've done things like where we kind of, I don't know, play with our differences and similarities. But that would be really fun. And I thought it was a very fun idea. It is really fun. And I think that... um I'm picturing the the thing on Insta where like you're we're pointing at each right. other. You know yeah, what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Oh yeah. That's like that a podcast one. version of that. And there's also <laughs> the fun little poll you can do where it's like yeah. who's more likely to, and then people just click. So yeah. look at you, Allie. All the good ideas. Thank you love for it. writing in, and thank you for listening, Megan. We love hearing from our listeners who say they feel like they know us and we're their friends because the sentiment really does go both ways. And for our friends who want to share their love for the show, we have a shop. Yes, it's true. If you go to the momhour.com and click on shop in the top bar, you'll find shirts, mugs, and even the cutest little onesies for sale. And we know that some of you got or gave the Mom Hour merch at the holidays. So if you do own any of our gear, we would love to see a picture of you. Go ahead and post a picture on social media and tag us in it. We'd love it. Oh yeah, that would be so fun to see. And I love thinking of us all over the country and the world drinking out of our Mom Hour mugs. So again, you can find that link right on the homepage of our website at themomhour.com or go directly to themomhour.com slash shop. Megan, today we're talking about our partner Minted, which is one of my favorite places to shop for gifts. I feel like people think of holiday cards and maybe framed photos when they think of Minted, but it's actually a marketplace for independent artists who create all kinds of things, home decor, table linens, journals and stationery, and original art. Well, I'm glad you reminded me of this, Sarah, because I think I'm guilty of forgetting to check back in with Minted to see what kind of new, unique home accents and gifts they might have. They have accent furniture, tabletop decor, and all kinds of art. When you shop their site, you get to learn all about the original artists and their backgrounds and stories, almost like shopping an incredibly well-curated craft fair, but online. And listeners, when you use our special link, you can help support the Mom Hour and an independent artist and a really incredible company all at the same time. Visit themomhour.com slash minted, a special page on our site where we've both picked some minted products we're eyeing right now, plus some great deals for you. Again, that's themomhour.com slash minted. 
All right, let's listen to the question that came in from Emily. Hi, Megan and Sarah. Longtime listener, first time caller. My question is about fibbing and white lies or really the alternate reality that kids seem to live in. I have a highly verbal preschooler who attends school a few days a week for several hours at a time. We will ask him things like, how did you like lunch today? And he'll tell us that they ran out of food and he didn't eat anything. Um, We know that this is unlikely to be true since he goes to a really great school with loving teachers. But conversely, we had another situation recently where he did tell us about an incident that happened where he was scared. Um, And when we reached out to the school, we found out that his account of the incident was correct. My question is to determine how to determine when to dismiss the tall tales that your little one tells and when to actually get involved um, and let authorities know. Or um, So I would imagine that this isn't isolated to the preschool age and that I would be facing this um, all through the teen years as well. Um, so knowing the difference between what's important enough to reach out to the teachers and what's what can be resolved within the home. So any guidance you have would be great. I very much appreciate it. Love the show. Thank you. Okay. So Emily, there is so much to unpack in this question. And I guess the first thing that I want to say is that in all of these cases, your child believes what they're telling you to be the case. Mm -hmm. Like they believe what they're saying is true, which makes it really tricky, right? So For whatever reason, your preschooler believed that they ran out of food. (laughs) And I don't know, like, I doubt he lied about that. That was probably not a story he invented. For some reason, that is his interpretation of events. So it does get really tricky because, like, it's like truthiness, right? Like, where are the levels of reality and truth? And then was the thing that happened to him at school dealt with where... You know, when you found went to the school and said, "Okay, so did this actually happen? And they said, yes. Do you feel that any more action was required on your part or was it more that your response to him could just be, wow, I'm so sorry that happened? You know, like, do you see what I'm saying? Like, was there any other action required? And I'm not 100 percent sure, but I think that does color things, because if the school hadn't appropriately acted and then you're finding out about it secondhand, that's kind of more a problem with the school's reaction than your son's tale Mm -hmm. or inconsistency in tale telling, if that makes sense. Sarah, I'm curious if you have thoughts about that. Yeah. And you're right. There is kind of a lot to unpack. The first thing I wanted to say, because when Emily first started talking, she, you know, talked about this being a question about fibbing and white lies. And we actually took that as a listener question a while back. I'll link to the episode Um, because lying intentionally um, is also a very interesting childhood developmental phase that you can all read up about. There's some very interesting expert takes on lying, but like you, Megan, I see this as more that sort of like, like Emily said, alternate reality of reporting (laughs) what happens at school, which could be a bit of fantasy. Sometimes it's preschoolers are literally in their pretend mind all day. Their, their fact reporting ability is pretty weak. In other words, even if I I don't think there's a lot of intentional white lying and fibbing going on in this case, although fibbing is definitely another thing that happens with kids. Right. Um, Well, and if he, if, if he heard from a, like a kid next to him, like the telephone game situation uh that they ran out of food, he'll believe it as though like the Pope said it, you know what I mean? Like they don't have a lot of discernment about the sources of their information and they just pair it what they hear. So Yeah, I I didn't take this as a white lie or fibbing either. I took it more as his version of the truth, which wasn't actually true. Exactly. An incomplete or fantastical reporting. So (laughs) given that and the the joke that you always hear at like um, back to school night is like teachers will say, I promise to believe only 20 percent of what your kid tells me about home. If you promise to believe only 20 percent of what your kid tells you about school and we all get a good laugh. And I think part of becoming a school parent is really, really internalizing that truth, that you are going to hear some reports about school that sound way off in in all kinds of ways. And I think with practice, you can take a beat, like think (laughs) on it um, and think about your next steps. I think in a preschool situation, you are 
it's it's within your rights to be quite in communication with teacher and administration because because we're talking about preschoolers, two, three, four year olds. Um, so it's I I might consider sending an email to the teacher or the administration, whoever you deal with, and saying, you know, um, Reed is really into telling some tales about preschool lately. We're getting a kick out of it at home. We know a lot of it is probably not accurate, but with your permission, I'd love to be able to kind of cross check some of these stories just so that I, you know, I understand what's happening and and do it in a way that sort of diffuses any kind of like Reed said you yelled at him in school today. You know, that's going in that way is always going to put a school on the defensive. But right. if you go in kind of acknowledging that, you know, the reporting is incomplete and you know that that's normal at this age, but you'd still like to have an open line of communication into what is happening, um, you'll probably be met with, you know, with a lot of acceptance on the school's end. So I would say starting with the regular communication with the school and just acknowledging that, you know, not everything your son says is true, but at the same time, it's still important to you to be able to, to talk to the teacher and know what is happening at school. So I think it's a communication thing. Um, I guess that's where I'll, I'll pause for now. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And I think without knowing exactly what the incident was, how it was handled in the school before mom found out about it. Right. Mm -hmm. And then like what, whether like, whether Emily bringing it up, then um, I guess sparked more investigation on the school's end. And then there was, so it's like kind of hard to tell which came first. Like, Mm -hmm. was there already an, was there already an appropriate response and Emily just kind of got found out about it later after the fact, or did she need to spark that? And that's like a whole nother question. And we don't know, like we can't really dig into it there, but I think you're right that that open line of communication is what makes any of those things possible. It it's what makes it possible for you to know when the thing already happened and just get the like FYI. Mm -hmm. And it's also what makes it possible for you to be able to take your child's information to the school to make sure they're aware because Mm -hmm. maybe they were, and maybe they weren't. And I'm not a hundred percent sure via her question, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I did. I did notice that Emily said, I would imagine this isn't isolated to the preschool age and that I'll be facing this all through the teen years as well. And Megan, I'm curious if you have any broad observations about whether school reporting gets more accurate and then maybe gets less accurate, whether we just or whether it's very much a kid personality thing. I have some thoughts, but you have more teenagers than I do. In my experience with the older kids, it is very much a personality thing, but I do think that there is more, I have noticed more drama around like my teachers hate me, Mm. blah, blah, blah in the middle school years. Um, Clara is deep in that right now. Like, it's not just my teacher asked me to stop talking. It's like, she's so mean. She yells at me all the time. She has an out for me. Well, what does that mean? Like when she yells at you, yes, she has it out. She hates me. And then Uh she'll say, well you know, she told me to stop talking. I'm like, well, were you talking? Yes. Okay. Did she yell it? Well, no, she just said it. Okay. That's not yelling. So (laughs) there's a lot of exaggeration. And I would say that's been pretty personality based with some exceptions. I mean, kids, some kids really like to tell stories. They like to get a reaction from telling the story and that does not change with teenagers. Um, so if they feel like they're getting laughs or their siblings Mm. are like, Whoa, what, you know, I can, I can tell sometimes there's a little swagger or like stories are being a little, invented a little, um, blown up. Now I will also say that I have personally heard things from my kids about things happening in school that are really like wrong and shouldn't be happening and have brought it to the attention of, um, authorities at school and just said exactly that. Like, I don't know how much of this is true, how much of it's hearsay. I'm just letting you know. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it is true. And sometimes it's been corroborated by other parents who Mm -hmm. heard it from their kids. And sometimes it's a rumor that's going around on social media, but it's a hundred percent true. And Mm -hmm in a way that's the kids being empowered to like have things that are happening that shouldn't be happening out there. Um, sometimes a kid who would, who would never report something on their own, either their parents wouldn't take it seriously or they'd just be too shy. Tell someone else it ends up on social media and then that teacher is held accountable. And I think that's good. Like that's good and bad, right? Because it can quickly turn into a bit of a witch hunt and Mm -hmm. get blown up out of proportion. But if it's handled correctly by the school, it also brings things to light sometimes that need to get brought to light. So that's been my experience. It's kind of a long winded way of saying yes, sometimes. <laughs> no, I think that's so fascinating. And especially because you're right, the the stakes are really high with teenagers. Yeah. The, the types of I'll use drama, but you know what I mean? The types of 
malarkey that they might be talking about happening at school could in fact be quite scary stuff. And so at first I was thinking, well, the teenagers aren't going to talk as much or they're like, but you're right. It is, it, it raises some of the same alarm bells than a, as a preschooler saying that they ran out of food and didn't feed me um, just in, in very different, very different ways. So. I think right. Interesting. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and just to, you know, put that into perspective too, Sarah, I don't know what your high school experience was like. Um, but there are things my friends and I still talk about to this day that we can't believe was allowed to happen uh-huh. in school. And there, there really just weren't a lot of mechanisms by which we could make it known. And mm. I think there was much more of a culture of sweeping things under the rug back then. And so, you know, there's like that balance now where things can, a, a match can get lit and blow up very quickly out of proportion, but sometimes that needs to happen. And we're all kind of walking that knife edge right now, right. I think. Yeah. yeah. I think if I'm hearing a through line, regardless of age, is that I, I hope to never, um, put my kid back on the hot seat about why or whether they told the exact truth about something that happened at school. Instead, it's almost like I want to take it in, understand that it may be incomplete. It may be misguided. It may be a, a white lie or a tall tale, but then like take that beat and decide what the next question is and to whom I'm going to ask it. Right. Because like, I don't think yep. I'd ever want to be like, well, why did you tell me that so-and-so pushed you when really like someone pushed her? Right. And it's like, well, but I don't know that we can solve that today. Instead, right. maybe I want right. to ask some open-ended questions to the teacher about supervision on the playground. You know what I mean? I guess, right. I guess I'm, I'm coming to the defense of little kids and big kids who are doing their best to let us in on these hours they spend away from us. And I think it's probably wise not to go into the nitty gritty of how true is their story, but to take that next step of, do I need to talk to someone? Does something need to happen? Does action have to happen? And, and to your point, to your um, example, Sarah, by the time your kid gets home in their mind, it may actually be that they were the one pushed on the playground. Like they could have turned things around. That fiction has been spun out by this point. Right. And like they've put themselves and that's, that's a great skill. They've empathized. They put themselves in their little friend's shoes and are taking on the persona of the kid that was pushed to the point that they believe they were pushed. And yeah. I, I think it's very hard sometimes to separate like, you know, truth in with a capital T, like tr- the truth of the situation versus facts and facts and truth aren't always mm. completely Ooh. equal. Oh, did I just blow your mind there? Yeah, blew my mind um, a little bit there. It reminds me, I just want to finish with this story. And I think I've talked about this before, but I remember being so blown away by, gosh, I think it was Isaac's like second grade teacher. So this goes way back and standing on the playground. This was a very experienced teacher and she was doing playground duty because it was a small um, Catholic school. So I think, you know, everybody had to do everything basically. So she's standing outside watching these kids with this just like very serene look on her face. And I remember thinking like, how is she so serene? Like there's a kid tugging on her sleeve, like every three seconds. And it was because no matter what they said, she would say, thank you for telling me. Mm-hmm. And it didn't matter if what yeah. they said was true because she was watching. So she knew what was happening, right? Like, she didn't need them to be correct. And she didn't need to correct them if they said something that was outlandish and mm-hmm. she didn't need to say, stop bothering me. And she didn't even need to act on it. It was just, thank you. Thank mm-hmm. you for that information. <laughs> um, and I think we could do kind of the same with our kids and then decide so with good. our adult brains what to do. Right. Yes. You know? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Um, the, and that just reminded me too, cause we started this talking about lying and fibbing. I will link up the conversation we had about specifically lying and fibbing. And then I was going to add, I guess I can see a small portion of these cases being a kid who really is interested in how, how tall a tale can I spin and what will mom or dad's reaction be? Um, because it is true that kids experiment with lying and fibbing and coming home and telling a totally wild Tale. And I'm now talking not about a preschooler, but maybe a six, seven or eight year old. I could see a kid going through that phase of, of actually lying about stuff that happens at school because some kids are truly liars and go through a big lying phase. I guess I just wanted to broaden this and say that I feel like that is probably a minority of the cases. And the rest of the time, it's what we've been talking about, which is this sort of soupy truth that kids live. <laughs> soupy in. truth. Yeah, yeah. I love it. <laughs> um, and I actually think, I think lying kids is a, is a really fascinating developmental phase. So I'm, I'm all, I'm supportive of those kids too, who come home and tell you that like a spaceship landed on the playground and swear up and down that it did. And <laughs> you know, that's cool. Yeah. Too. All right. Um, well, we have an email that I will read that came from Victoria. 
So Victoria says, hi, Megan and Sarah. I'm a longtime listener, mom to three-year-old twin girls. We decided to try to add a third now that the twins are more manageable. And lo and behold, this time I'm pregnant with triplets. Triplets. Oh, my gosh. Oh my goodness. Okay. So Victoria says, first, I want to say thank you to you both for being real over the years about the positives and negatives of a large family. I feel like I have at least a decent idea of what being a mom of five will be like. And that has made the last few weeks a little less intense. What I'm interested in today is any recommendations you have for not disappearing into a pile of small children. (laughs) I I know I found having twins very isolating because it was a challenge to leave the house. And I worry about my older girls not getting enough of a chance to socialize or participate in activities. Also worried about losing my mind if I don't get the same. Okay. Well, Victoria, I just want to say I am thinking of you. I think this is awesome. And you're going to have the coolest family. And also I can only like putting myself in your shoes. I can only imagine what emotions would be running through my head. Um, many of them very scary. (laughs) So I do think it's great that you've got some experience with multiples. Like that feels Mm -hmm. to me like a little blessing right there. Like you've already got your twins. You made it through those first three years. You know what that looks like. So you've got some of your sea legs under you when it comes to, you know, parenting multiple children of the same age. So that's great. I think that your experience of having five kids isn't going to resemble mine in any meaningful way until they're probably like three, maybe Mm -hmm. when, you know, when you've got like maybe at the diaper stage, like I'm just picturing what that would have looked like if I had had three little kids all in diapers at the same Mm -hmm. time. Um, It would have been really different from my experience. I just want to be open about that because I can speak to being a mom of five, but not a mom of five under those circumstances. Mm -hmm. And, and I also know that for me, a big part and um, Victoria mentioned this later in her email, but like I've talked about in the show, a big part of me feeling like I still had a social life and things to do and people to be with and for my kids to be with really revolved around bringing people into my home. Um, Mm -hmm. as, as she pointed out, like I had a lot of social gatherings where I would just be like, bring your kids, whatever, stop by. I don't care. Just come over and be with me and let's spend time together. And that was easier for me than it might be for you, Victoria, because of the fact that I lived in a town, like I'd specifically moved to play. I moved to places where my people already were, Mm -hmm. um, almost like as a self-preservation, like a proactive self-preservation move. I, it would have been harder if I was in a town where I didn't know as many people, but not impossible, just harder. Mm -hmm. Like it would have taken more effort to go out and find those people. Um, but I don't know that I did. I don't know that I did avoid disappearing into a pile of small children for a while. I I do think literally I was that person for a, a couple of years. And I think you might be there for a little longer than me, just because that feels really realistic and reasonable to expect with that mm-hmm. number of really little kids. And I think if there's going to be opportunities for you to not have that, um, it's probably going to in mean you leaving the house. I, yeah. I just don't see any other way. Like, even if you have people come to you, if there's literally that many small children, they're still going to swarm you. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't, I don't know how else to do that necessarily. And some moms I know of multiples just really like dive into that mm-hmm. um, and like dive into that pile of children and just kind of wall around in the bottom for a while and they're happy. And some really have to put structure around a way to escape that. And I don't know where you'll fall, but I I think either one, either solution is fine and great. Yeah. Well said, Megan. And I also just want to congratulate Victoria and celebrate what an awesome family this is going to be. And we're just so glad you're part of our listener community. I want to open it up to our listener community I'm sure we have, I'm not sure if we have anybody with twins, then triplets, we might, um, but any other large families, multiple multiples, um, reach out to us. Hello at the momhour.com. If you're willing to be put in touch with Victoria, I, I think we have such an, a great community of people willing to flatten the curve for others, um, and kind of lessen, lessen the learning that has to happen on, especially some of those logistical questions. Like how do I actually put five children under four in the car and get through the door and all of that. And, and I just echo what you said, Megan, about for a while, it may feel like you have disappeared into a pile of small children and remembering that this is going to feel like big stages. The first 
six months of five children is going to feel very different from, say, the two-year mark. It will still be really hard. Three two-year-olds and two five-year-olds-ish. I mean, that that is still a, a lot of small children, but it's not the same as three newborns and two preschoolers. Right. You know what I mean? So so thinking of it as as seasons and stages that however hard it is, it's not likely to be the same kind of hard. And I would say that's true of a lot of parenting. It's It can stay hard, but the hard will at the very least shift shift shape and change yeah. to a new form. And the, the last thing I wanted to say was on the small comment about worrying about her older two girls missing out on something. And, and this is something I feel really strongly about. And I've said in multiple listener questions, answers, which is, I think we, we can reframe what older siblings are handed when they are given let's say a bunch of younger siblings or a younger sibling with special needs or a younger sibling who takes up all of mom's time because they cry 24 seven. Um, it is hard to see or to think that we're seeing our oldest get less of us than they used to. But I would really encourage you to reframe that as not what has been taken away from that child, but what has been added. And I just pictured those two girls being the most awesome big sisters and what they are gaining by being part of this awesome family is not an apples to apples trade with what their life would be like if they didn't have triplet younger siblings. But I right. choose to see that not as what they're going to miss out on, but, but just a different awesome way to grow up. And that's, and like I said, I think that's true. It's a common worry that you're somehow doing a disservice to the older siblings by adding a baby. Maybe it's because the baby's coming so soon or whatever the thing right. is. Yeah. But, but it's just I would, different. It, it's, but just it's not different. worse. It's not a yeah. loss. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah. And to your point about, you know, for mom, like each of these stages that you're in have an end and you'll go into a different stage, which might be hard too, but like, it'll be a different stage. That's also true for your older girls. Like that's also true for the twins. So yeah, there might be like a six month period of their life where maybe a three-year-old who was used to running around town all day and being entertained might find that a little bit boring or different. Although I don't know how life could be boring with triplets in the house. I think they're going to have plenty to keep them occupied and they're probably going to love their little baby siblings. But um, that stage will end for them too. So like they'll also move into a new phase mm. when the younger siblings are getting older and they're able to get out and do things again. Or maybe they get old enough older that they can independently be doing things, um, without you having to be the one setting it up and getting them there. Like mm -hmm. they're going to go, they have lots of years ahead of them of childhood yes. to experience all these things that you wish you could give them right now. Yeah. But that's not how it works always. Like you can't always give them all the things all at once at the same time. I agree. Well, Victoria, congratulations. We're really excited for you. Keep us posted. And again, listeners, if you feel like this family looks anything like yours or that you have any encouragement to share, just shoot us an email. Hello at the momhour.com and we can pass it on. That's always fun to do. Yeah. And before we wrap, just a reminder to go check out our sponsor, Matter of Fact. It's a skincare company we have been loving, specifically their ascorbic acid brightening C serum combined with that minimalist hydrating cream. Yes. And Matter of Fact is offering 15% off to our listeners. Just use code MOM15 at checkout for 15% off your first purchase, and you get that at matteroffact.com. Again, matteroffact.com, and use code MOM15 for 15% off. And Megan, we will be back coming up on Sunday for another More Than Mom episode. And then next week, a week from today on Tuesday, we've got more listener questions. So this was fun, and I will talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. 